post-mortem PP. That's gotta be like a health hazard, right? Hey nerds, welcome back to my channel. We're gonna be doing another movie review. Just me this time. <laughs> but before we get into that, I just wanna thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Now let's get into this. So the movie that I'm going to be talking about today is Lisa Frankenstein. I asked y'all um, if this was something that you guys would wanna see and y'all voted most of y'all voted yes, so here we are. All right, time for a little synopsis on this movie. Lisa Frankenstein is a horror comedy that follows our main character, Lisa Swallows, played by Katherine Newton. She befriends an undead gentleman in need of human parts, and together they embark on a, um, a spree to get those parts <laughs> to help him out. I was debating on whether I should go over the plot of the movie, but I think I'm gonna skip that for this one. Instead of covering the plot of the movie, I just wanna talk about some details that I noticed or that I enjoy in my favorite parts about the movie and just really talk about the characters. I'll start with the details that I like. So I'm sure if you've seen this movie, you already know this, but Lisa Frankenstein has absolutely nothing to do with Lisa Frank. If you don't know what Lisa Frank is, it's basically this uh, line of school supplies. It's mostly school supplies. That's like all magical and colorful. It has like, you know, whales, tigers, unicorns, and pink glitter all over it. <laughs> it looks like this. It looks like this, okay? And so I thought that Lisa Frankenstein was a play on the brand Lisa Frank, especially um, given the movie's aesthetic. It's very bright and colorful, even though it's a horror movie. And the first thing I noticed, I watched this movie twice. But uh, the first thing that I noticed um, about this movie is it has a lot of influences. This movie is set in 1989 and you can see all the inspiration that um, it was drawing from. Heathers, Edward Scissorhands, Weird Science, stuff like that. And as a lover of 80s movies, I noticed it right away. I also appreciate the fact that we have another horror movie that's both campy and whimsy. There's tons of campy horror movies, but there's not that many that are both campy and whimsical. And I feel like this kind of just fits right in with that subcategory of the genre. I also like that this movie didn't go the typical route of depicting uh, the decade of the 80s, you know, just a bunch of neon malls and Madonna. <laughs> there's more of a darkness and a more grungy type of atmosphere and I'm guessing because it was nearing the end of the decade and about to transition into the 90s but it still had that 80s flair to it. I was very pleased when I found out uh, this next detail. The director of this movie is Zelda Williams. That is Robin Williams' daughter. May he rest in ever loving peace. And guess who it was written by? Guess who it was written by? This movie was written by Diablo Cody. Yeah. And if you don't know who that is, that is the same woman who wrote Juno and Jennifer's Body. So she is, she, yeah. You, you, y'all know about Diablo Cody, if you know. <laughs> she makes gems. She does. <laughs> Speaking of Jennifer's Body, I wanted to kind of bring that into this movie review because I saw a lot of similar themes in Lisa Frankenstein as I did in Jennifer's Body. You know, there is a girl who goes through a traumatic experience. That girl comes into newfound power and it ends up gobbling her up and swallowing her whole. Same, same premise here. I definitely see the similarities. Lisa Frankenstein to me is another coming of rage story. And I mean, I love that category of that that you know that breed of film and yeah this is a, just another one added underneath there okay this <laughs> this is a little silly but I have to mention it Lisa main character in this film she <laughs> is what I think Chapel Roman would look like if 
Tim Burton created her. This is definitely Chapel Roan if she existed within a Tim Burton universe. Like Chapel Roan in her Beetlejuice era or something. <laughs> Another detail that I really appreciated was the detail of this house. From what I have heard, especially from older people who have watched this movie, um, the house was era appropriate and I appreciate that it's not that type of sitcom decor that people come to expect when they're watching a movie that's set in the 80s. It was very, it was, it was different. It was very eye-catching. It had a little pizzazz to it. It wasn't like, you know, just a normal full house situation. Now clearly by the title, obviously, this is another adaptation of the story of Frankenstein and the movie. Now being a horror fan, I have a soft spot for all of the classic monster films, my two favorite being Dracula and Frankenstein. And ever since, you know, the 1930s, we have seen countless um, adaptations and retellings of the story of Frankenstein. This has the basic premise of that story intact but it's just thrown in to a different decade and it has those added layers of 80s aesthetic and lifestyle and it makes it very zany. <laughs> the characters in this movie, I found them to be interesting, even the ones that I didn't like all that much. But I wanna go through the characters that I liked or that I had some kind of reaction to, but I'm gonna start with Lisa. So I touched on Lisa a little bit. Um, Lisa is our main character. She's the black sheep of the family. She's kind of strange, but there is a reason for, for all of this. So two years prior, her and her mom were home alone playing a game and then this masked um, killer came in, invaded their home, and in an effort to save Lisa's life, her mother fought off the killer or tried to fight off the killer but unfortunately her mother did not make it and Lisa heard the whole thing happen. Of course this changed her permanently and she became a social pariah. She also became very obsessed with macabre things. <laughs> I mean, she hangs out in a cemetery for the fun. So I, I would say that's pretty macabre. And I got hints, tinges, notes, of Lydia Dietz from Beetlejuice. I definitely got a Lydia Dietz vibe from Lisa Swallows. She's not too fond of the cliques at her school, you know, the giggly cheerleaders, the jocks, all that stuff she kind of just keeps to herself. But there is one guy that she thinks is pretty cool. His name is Michael or something. I don't know, he don't matter. <laughs> she has a crush on him. She thinks he's all deep and stuff because he reads and he reads from you know, women authors. She, he, oh, uh, girl, wait till you find out about Michael. I'm not gonna spoil it any further than I already have, but wait till you find out that Michael ain't shit for real. Okay. <laughs> so the next character I want to talk about is Taffy. Dare I say, dare I say, other than Lisa, Taffy was my favorite character in this movie. Now, if you've seen this movie, don't come for me yet. I know what she did, and what she did was wrong. I'm not gonna say what she did, y'all. I don't wanna spoil it too much. But aside from that, Taffy is my favorite. Taffy is Lisa's stepsister. Now, Taffy, on the surface, is, you know, the traditional, uh, stereotypical, pretty popular girl, you know, cheerleader, she's one of pageants, etc, etc. But that's not all there is to her. There's more to Taffy. She's pretty much Queen Bee of the school, but she's not vain and vicious like most characters under this archetype are. She's actually a very well-rounded girl and she is so sweet and loving towards Lisa. She knows that Lisa has a hard time fitting in and she's kind of standoffish and she gets picked on but that does not deter her from being a loving sister and trying to encourage her and you know get her to see the bright side of things. She really does love Lisa. I also really like her name. It's very fitting. It's not just because of the decade, but Taffy, my name is Taffy, and she has that very upbeat, bubbly personality. How fitting. <laughs> Her name is Taffy, I believe you. All right, next character I wanna talk about is Dale, Lisa's dad and Taffy's stepdad. So if you have seen Stranger Things, this is the same guy that plays Ted in Stranger Things. And y'all know about Ted, okay? He basically played the same character in this movie. Like this was Ted 
2.0. I'm not even joking. I don't know if it's because he's so monotone and I felt like I was watching Ted all over again. And I'm like, I really hope this isn't the only character this guy can do because I'm not joking. If you've seen Stranger Things, go watch this movie. That is Ted. That's not Dale. That's Ted 2.0. Next character I want to talk about is Janet. Now, this is Lisa's stepmom and Taffy's, like, biological mom. There, there has to be a villain, right? There, there always has to be a villain. And Janet, damn it, Janet, <laughs> she was a good villain. Now, this is the same actress that was, um... What's her name? Oh my goodness. This is the same actress that played Jessie in Gerald's Game. I've never seen her in a role like this. I've seen her in a, in a couple things. I think I saw... Wasn't she in Haunting of Hill House? I I still haven't finished Haunting of Hill House, so I, I don't remember. But if she was, I think I saw her in that too. I think she was in that too. I'm getting off track. I'm sorry. <laughs> the actress that played her did an amazing job because I did not like this woman from the get. She was just so... Like... She just made me go, Ugh. like, <laughs> you know what I mean? She has it out for Lisa personally. And it's simply because she is different. And she basically wants Lisa to be taffy. But Lisa's not taffy. Lisa is Lisa. And Janet is not giving Lisa enough grace. Literally six months after her mom passed, um, Lisa's dad, Dale, met Janet. And they hit it off. She has never I feel like she has never really tried to understand Lisa because that messes you up that would mess anybody up I'm sure like you watched your own mother you know get unalived in the comfort of your own home and you had to watch the whole thing hear the whole thing and she just swears up and down that Lisa just does stuff to get attention so she can get sympathy points no honey she is still grieving she is trying her best and you are not giving her, you're not understanding enough for me. Janet, she just wants to find something to blame on Lisa all the time, all the time. And to make an example out of her and not coddle her because her mom died, boo-hoo. Girl, do you hear your, girl, oh my, mm -mm. <laughs> That's how you know the actress is amazing because I'm, why am I getting angry all over again? <laughs> over a fictional character. Great job on your part. The last character I want to talk about is the creature played by none other than Cole Sprouse. I know some people have like mixed feelings about him. I don't know what he did. I'm not in the rotation of the Sprouse brothers like that. He did something like a couple years ago or a few, like what did he do? Because I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, tuning into that when it was going around the whole internet. What did he do to y'all? <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Like, what happened to make y'all like not like this man anymore? What happened? Someone tell me. The creature is our Frankenstein monster. He doesn't have a name. He was resurrected the same way he was unalive. By a big, scary green ball of lightning. Solid. Now, the creature can't talk, but Cole does an amazing job you know, with his physical acting. So let me tell you something real quick about the creature, okay? So you know how I said that him and Lisa go on like this spree to get him human parts? Well, you know how Frankenstein came to be through electricity. That's how he, you know, was given life essentially. So we have that element in this movie, but not by lightning always. There's this tanning bed, right? <laughs> So 80s, there's this tanning bed that is kind of wonky and it kind of electrocutes whoever uses it, Lisa included. So in order for the body parts to like actually mesh with the creature's corpse, they have to stick him, they sew the parts on, right? Lisa sews the parts onto him, she sticks him in the um, tanning bed and after it's done, like he's done cooking, it becomes like a... A real part it becomes part of him and it looks good but I say all that to say each time they sew a new part onto him and he keeps using the tanning bed more and more he becomes more human like because this is what he looked like at the beginning of the movie right he was literally a living corpse fresh out the ground and as the movie goes on you see him using the tanning bed and then moving around more he becomes more human like and you can really see that, I love the detail of that, you know, transition of him moving around like he has rigor mortis because, you know, he was dead. And then eventually by the end of the movie, he is moving around like a human being. He's very fluid, fluid in his motions. 
and um, he has more control over his limbs and more stability. He did an amazing job with that detail of, you know, each time he becomes more human, he kind of like softens and stabilizes. Very great detail and good job, Cole. Cole delivered a solid performance and he didn't even say anything. That's talent. <laughs> So knowing me, I'm always going to have a takeaway. Whatever I watch, I don't care what it is, I'm going to have at least one takeaway. The first takeaway or message I want to talk about is female rage. Now this isn't a very serious, straight and narrow depiction of it, but it's there. It, it It's in the movie. Lisa has been through so much. She lost her mom. She was essayed. She can't seem to catch a break. She's angry and she has every right to be angry. And you see that anger come to a head when all she wants is acceptance and love. The next takeaway I want to speak on is finding your crowd. As Lisa spends more time with the creature, she becomes very attached to him. And I think it's because, you know, she sees him, she has an understanding because, you know, she relates to him. They were alone at one point and now they're alone together. <laughs> I know this sounds very silly when I'm talking about a teenage girl and an undead person, <laughs> but they seem to find solace within one another and that what, that's what draws them to each other. You know, she is looking for love and acceptance out there on the world above the ground. <laughs> And she was so willing to like feel that from anywhere, I guess you could say, that she was willing to pour out. And in the beginning of the movie, you see that she is pouring out that love and affection and that friendliness to the creature's grave. Because she, like I said, she would um, hang out in the cemetery. And she was tending his grave, reading to him, talking to him. And... Apparently he he heard her because you know when he got reanimated That's the first person that he went to was Lisa and he's like, oh my god I feel seen like oh my gosh like we see each other It's, it's cute. <laughs> this may sound like a reach to some of you, but this is just my interpretation But I'd like to think that when Lisa was sewing um, The parts onto the creature she was putting herself back together as well She was healing to be with someone who likes you for you and you know sees you and understands you it makes you feel whole it makes you feel complete now that's very cheesy but it's the truth for some people okay and the last thing i want to touch on or you know talk about like my takeaways is gray morality now um, there's a bit of spoilers here so if you don't want those click off sorry <laughs> it was nice seeing you though <laughs> so <laughs> when i said they go on a spree lisa and the creature um, they're not robbing graves. They are taking these fresh parts from fresh, alive human bodies. Okay? <laughs> now, unaliving people is wrong. We, we know this. Like, duh. But also, there is something very Dexter about this. Very Dexter about this. Because if you think about it, if you've seen the movie, everyone who got got to, you know, for harvest for the creature's body, um... They all did Lisa wrong in some way, shape, or form. They only really hurt people that did something wrong to them. Well, except for that cop. She didn't deserve that. <laughs> she, she, they just got caught and they had to, like, you know, get rid of the witness, I guess. And yes, we know this is wrong. Like, unaliving people is wrong. But I don't know. You can't help but root for Creature and Lisa because we also get... Sorry, I'm all over the place, but I just remembered this. We also get a little bit of a backstory on the creature. In the very opening credits of the movie, it's like an animation telling his life story. He was this musician back in the Disney, like I'm thinking like 1800s or something like that, because you know, whatever. And he falls in love with this young woman, and you know, I think they get married, or they, they just fall in love, but then the woman leaves him for another man, and he's heartbroken. And on top of him getting dumped, he gets struck by lightning and he, 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 you know, he's gone. He doesn't get to, you know, heal or anything. He just dies with a broken heart. I say that to say, you know, you can't help but root for these two, you know, outcasts. Because they've obviously had a rough go of it. And they just want 
they just want what they want they just want to be as normal as possible they just want to be loved they just want to be accepted oh side note so 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 the the there's a scene in this movie <laughs> This is another spoiler. I wasn't trying to spoil this movie, but I gotta talk about this. Um, there is a scene in this movie, and the creature comes into... He gains access to a male appendage that he cut off, okay? He cut off a person that wronged Lisa, just that's all I'm gonna say. And by this point in the movie, Lisa and the creature have romantic feelings for each other. So what do you think happens? They decide to sew on that severed appendage to the creature so they can uh, knock boots. I have so many questions. So first, <laughs> post-mortem PP. That's gotta be like a health hazard, right? That's got, that's, that's, right? Right? Like magic and um, tanning bed be damned. Post-mortem PP? Like what? <laughs> Doesn't that count as... I mean, he's alive, but at the same time, he's not? So I was just like, uh... I don't think this is legal. And then on top of that, speaking of legal, ain't he like two whole centuries older than her? <laughs> I was like, uh... Like, I don't know. But yeah, that was just another side note. I, I, that was my main question because this movie had like some pretty funny parts in it. This movie was funny. But that whole like montage of them sewing it on and then getting to the point where they do it, I'm like, oh, okay. That's new. <laughs> but overall, I give this... <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> overall... Oh, wait, no, wait. And so when they get to the love scene, they depict it as a cartoon. And it's both of them riding a rocket. <laughs> I'm not gonna say anymore. That's it, that's it, that's all. I'm done, oh my god. Overall, I give this movie... Um, 9 out of 10. It was really good. Do I feel like there could have been a little bit more... Yes, but I'm not sure what. You know what I mean? There just, there just needed to be more, like in a general sense, just more. But um, I really do like this cast. They did an amazing job. Um, Catherine Newton is a very great leading lady. And she really, she did a good job as Lisa. She did a great job as Lisa. Yeah. And this is now added to my, one of my favorite movies to recently come out but yeah 9 out of 10 for Lisa Frankenstein so that concludes our video for today if you enjoyed it please leave a like and if you made it to the end of this video uh comment a lightning bolt yeah sparky <laughs> and subscribe if you want to I'll see y'all on the next go round okay bye